my mother was an artist and I think that from an early age I was inspired to draw because it was encouraged and that encouragement I feel like from my parents definitely allowed gave me a lot of confidence you know and and sort of just a, a framework that that it was possible to be an artist you know that there um, that that it was you know something that you could actually you know do as a career although I always understood that it was going to be an uphill battle you know I think I always understood that being an artist was not an easy route to take uh, my sister was actually a professional ballerina for many years so you know for I think in our family and my other sister um, you know was a photographer for for a time so I think in my family it was really encouraged that we pursue our interest you know and drawing just always felt really intuitive for me you know making art in some way felt like um, the thing to do and so when I you know when I went to college and I and I studied and I went to college late I did other things but when I came back to getting my bachelor's degree in uh, studio art I didn't think about it too much I didn't think about what I was going to do that that hard you know I didn't I didn't like mull over it too much actually hiking the Appalachian Trail was was part of a way for me to reassess what was important and um, after I hiked the Appalachian Trail I went to graduate school at the University of Georgia so I moved down to Athens Georgia from Philadelphia I ended up living there for 12 years um, and after graduate school I got a teaching job I taught as a graduate student and my father is a college professor so once again like that model allowed me um, you know just it, it, it gave me a, a sort of framework to know that this this was a viable career this was something that that was possible you should just pursue what you want to pursue and and maybe I would enjoy teaching and it just happened that when I was a graduate student I really enjoyed teaching so that ended up becoming my my current career and you know really there's no looking back at this point it seems like that's that's the right fit for me and so as far as printmaking goes I um, I started making prints in, in undergrad and it's just because we had a really good print shop at UMass Boston and we didn't have much else so we had a painting studio and a drawing studio and a print shop there was no ceramics there wasn't really a sculpture program at the time so I think for me what printmaking did was it allowed me to do something more than painting and drawing it gave me uh, a more tactile way to make artwork to make images you know actually carving into the block um, or etching onto a metal plate there's a physical quality to that that um, I enjoy more than just drawing or just painting and although those are th those have a physical and tactile quality somehow printmaking the element of um, surprise you know being being able to um, create something and not necessarily know what it's going to look like uh, right off the bat. Uh, as you know, Jessica and I were talking about earlier, you know, there's, there's an analogy to like ceramics, for example, you know, where you don't necessarily know what the thing is going to look like till you print it or till you fire it in the kiln. And that for me, I think, um, made printmaking a more appealing medium than some of the other options that I had in art school. So, you know, every day I, I do a, a sketch um, that sort of reflects on my time here at the park. And, you know, in a lot of ways, like I said before, it's, it's a sketch from observation, but it also has notes about, you know, maybe something I did that day or something I observed. You know, I'm really interested in the plants that I've been seeing or the, the animals. Also just general experiences. Um, you know, a lot of these sketches are 
uh, about they're, they're not so much about moving through the landscape, which is where my photographs come in. So my photographs are, are more about me kind of moving through the landscape. These are a lot about being still, you know, just I, I'm, I'm basically focusing sketches on stuff that uh, that's around Fell Cabin where I'm staying. And um, so this is like inside Fell Cabin. This is from the little uh, porch the tiny narrow porch that I have on, on Fell Cabin. And once again, you know, all kinds of notes um, and ideas. So once again, this is the, the idea generating part of it where I'm thinking about, you know, where I want to take the direction of like a print series after this. As I'm sketching and I'm also thinking about what I'm doing. So sketching is just a, it's just a practice. This is that big picture window in the front so me kind of sitting and looking out and drawing the picnic tables out there um and this is spell cabin i had a luna moth come to the window the other day i mean it was the size of my hand it was wild i couldn't believe it i told a friend of, i actually texted a friend of mine the picture of it just like connected to the uh to the screen <laughs> and uh, she was like you've been visited that's really special so that was kind of cool oops there's my little turkeys right there um, that's drawn from memory and this is the sketch I was just working on right now so that's the it's the stone wall of the massa Nutton. I've been drawing so much stone while I'm here it's it's a really uh, defining feature of the park. And, you know, it's made me, even last night when I was, you know, working on this, this color, one of those color drawings, um, you know, I was drawing stone wall, a big stone wall, and I was thinking about how stone, you know, kind of that idea of like, uh, it's written in stone you know, like there's a permanence to stone, like the material itself. And there's so much stone in this park. And, and even when you, you come across, like I've come across a, a few times in the woods, cause I'm looking for them probably, as like just like a weird stone structure that maybe was something, I have no idea. It doesn't resemble anything that it, that it maybe once was because who knows, it could have been just like, a part of a chimney or it could have been some outdoor structure or something that had wood on it and that that the wood is long gone but the stone still exists and stone as being sort of this kind of more permanent material that um, this park is so it's, it's so much of it exists in this park and that will be here way beyond us how did I get on that topic I don't oh because I was drawing stone <laughs> Usually um, what becomes my woodblock prints are my photographs. Yeah, my photographs are, are more, and you know, sometimes I'll just sketch right from my photographs. You know, that, that often, it gives me a little bit more freedom in a way, you know, to um, compose. Like when I'm, when I'm sketching, sure, to some degree it's, is there a place where I can sit, you know? Is there like a comfortable place I can, I can sketch for hours? Um, but the sketching is just, once again, it's more of an exercise for me. Um, it keeps me in the moment. It allows me to, to be in, in the landscape. And it does like allow me to kind of think about what I want to do, but it's the sketch is less of like a finished product you know it doesn't necessarily it's rare that this that the sketch itself becomes the print it's usually me sketching from a photograph because or i'm compositing different photographs together that's oftentimes what becomes the print itself the main idea for making prints is that you're making multiple copies of something. And so therefore you need what's known as a matrix. Your matrix is either, in this case, my wood block. It can also be a metal plate where the image goes on because I do also do etchings. Um, but I'm gonna talk about wood block printing today. And so the wood block print really has 
quite a long history. It's the oldest form of printmaking. Um, the Chinese developed it as a way to make stamps. And so they basically carved out characters and they also carved out characters in wood and they also had ceramic, um, ceramic characters that they would print. Later on, it was um, appropriated and um, really innovated by the Japanese. And so this is like the uh, 17th through the 19th century. That's the 1600s to the 1800s. The Japanese developed a form of woodblock printing that almost that became pretty much an industry. And so this is what ultimately is the tradition that's inspiring my imagery or my printmaking, I should say. Even though these that I'm printing here are not in color, so most people know tradition traditional Japanese woodblock prints as being very colorful. But I also make very colorful prints, but today I'm going to be printing black and white prints. So um, this is the wood block that I'm using today. And um, what I'm going to do right now is show you the way that I carve the imagery on the block. So first I, I draw directly onto the block, just with pen. I lock that drawing in with shellac so that the drawing is stable. It doesn't, doesn't move anywhere. And now I'm ready to carve. Now with um, carving, the image that gets printed is the image that's raised. So I'm actually carving out everything that doesn't get printed. And that's the challenge of woodblock printing. So you have to, you have, to have a little experience to kind of know that what you're going to carve is not actually going to be printed. So you're thinking, you're thinking a little backwards in, in that sense. Um, I use a series of tools, um, gouges, to carve into the block. Uh, this one is actually a Japanese tool right here. It's a really nice tool. And um, what I do is I basically go in and I push forward, push the gouge into the material. And that essentially removes that material. So when I'm carving, there is a grain to the wood, and um, that's what makes it both really wonderful, but also a little more challenging. Um, the wood I'm using here is a type of Sheena plywood, so it's actually something that's used often in, in more contemporary Japanese printmaking. And um, it does have several layers of grain. So in other words, the very top layer, it's a laminate, which means that there's several pieces of wood that are glued together. And so the very top piece of wood goes in one direction and the other one just below it goes in another direction. So as I'm carving, if I, if I carve through that first laminate, that first layer, I'm actually hitting another layer underneath that's probably going in the direction that I'm carving if I'm carving against the grain. So the one thing that's really nice about wo using wood for, uh, we'll call it relief printmaking, because that's the type of printmaking that I'm doing, because everything that gets printed is in relief, is that the wood grain can sometimes inform your image as well. It makes a really beautiful texture when you print. And you'll see that when I actually get to print a, um, uh, I actually pull a print next. But as I'm carving um, against the grain, it, it kind of in some ways is a little easier because um, you're actually cutting through those strands as opposed to when you're carving with the grain. Um, what can sometimes happen is the, um, the tool or the, the strip of wood that you're carving away can sometimes get away from you. In other words, it can kind of go forward and you have to be able to um, have enough skill to stop it in its tracks. So as I, 
as I carve, I actually, um, it, it kind of informs the marks I make. So in other words, the drawing is there, but it's not a uh, exact copy of what's gonna happen. In other words, I make changes as I go along. And that's, that's really what I like about printmaking is that a drawing is a drawing, right? It's very direct, you know, it's, it's, it's there once it's done. Nothing else happens to it. But when the drawing is on a, a piece of wood and I start carving it, something happens, something changes. So in other words, there's like a sculptural quality to the mark making that I can't do with drawing. And that's why the, it's advantageous to, um, for me to make things into a print because it, it creates um, a different, it gives it a different level, it gives it a different, the imagery, a different type of depth, even though it's very flat in a lot of ways. Um, but as an illusion, it's very flat, but it also kind of, um, creates more textural opportunities, if that makes sense. So, um, for example, you know, um, on this block, what I've done here is I've, I've put in a texture in these areas right here that did not exist in the drawing. So I'm kind of making things up as I'm going along. I'm, I'm adding information. It's almost like the, the carving tool is another is another pen, another pencil, another brush. It just adds, it sort of changes the image as I go. And so there's another level of uh, translation that happens. So probably these, just to create the imagery, it took me a couple weeks. And then to draw the imagery on the block, it takes me a little less time, you know, maybe a week to do that. And then to carve each one of these, I would say, you know, it's probably five hours, and I'm just gonna throw out that estimate because I don't, honestly don't really know. It's probably like five to eight hours a block, if that gives you a, a sense of it. So that's, and I haven't even gotten to the proofing stage. So then what I would do is I would proof each block, and then after I proof the block, I would um, make changes and then run in addition. And these might even have a color element to them. I'm not sure yet, um, which would mean I would carve another block for color. But I haven't gotten to that stage yet. Right now, they're just black and white images. Okay. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to print the block. And there's a couple. What, what I've created here is basically a homemade registration jig. And this is just so I can register the paper with the block because what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be inking up the block and then putting the paper on top. So in other words, I can't see where the paper is. Um, therefore, I have to set up a, a system so that the paper is going to land in a certain place for when I um, actually go ahead and print the block. So let me talk about some of the tools that I'm going to be using to print this block. And so this is a, a more traditional way of printing, is printing by hand. And so I'm going to be using this uh, large wooden spoon right here, which um, traditionally would be known as a baron. So this would be uh, usually a round pad that um, would be used to apply pressure to the paper and therefore transferring the ink onto the paper. But in this case, I've just found the perfect, actually it's been handed down to me, the perfect wooden spoon that has a very flat surface and is, is really, um, it really slides across the paper well. So this works beautifully as a baron, a way of um, creating pressure. Um, I'm also going to use what's known as a uh, brayer. So this is essentially a rubber roller that um, allows me to roll ink onto the block. And um, this is just another uh, pressure, a tool I use for, for pressure, um, but more of like a baron. It's um, another wooden, basically, uh, tool. And then I'm gonna use a putty knife to draw the ink out of the can. So 
here I'm using oil-based ink and this is not a traditional method so what I'm what I'm doing here for this printing process is I'm doing kind of a combination of like traditional Japanese techniques but also uh, Western more modern Western techniques using oil-based ink using a brayer um, this is this is less traditional, um, a deviation from the traditional Japanese woodblock printing. So it's kind of like a combination of Eastern and Western printmaking styles. Typically, I would also be able to print this um, block on a press. So I'm printing it right now um, by hand, but normally I would be printing this on a press. So that's why I'm using the combination of both Eastern and Western techniques. I've kind of developed my own. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull ink out of the can, and I'm using a black oil-based printmaking ink. And then I'm gonna mix this ink just to get it to be a little bit looser. because I want to be able to roll it out pretty easily onto that block. Okay. So when I roll the ink out, what I need to make sure to do is that I get a nice, even application of ink on the roller. Because when I roll that across the block, I want that to be even as well. Okay. So now when I roll onto the block, you know, what you're going to notice is that everything that's raised is going to be covered with ink. Everything that's been carved is not. So once again, this is where the relief printing process gets its name because you are essentially printing everything that is raised, everything that is in relief. So that's where we get the name for relief printing. And a lot of people do relief printing on different materials such as linoleum. That's another popular material that's used for relief printing. Linoleum is a lot softer so it's a little easier to carve into. However, because wood is harder and has a little bit more stiffness, it holds a line a little better. So sometimes you can get more detail with woodblock prints because it's just a, a stiffer material. So what I'm doing right now is I'm just making sure I have a nice even application on my block. And I also want to make sure, because I'm printing this by hand, I want to make sure that I have enough ink to be able to transfer onto the paper. All right, I think we're ready. So now I'm gonna push that into my registration jig and I've got my paper over here. So right now, because I'm still running proofs, I'm just gonna print this on newsprint. And um, I'm actually going to use the, um, the top of this registration jig as a guide and I'm just gonna eye it because this is only a proof. 
Okay, so I lay, once the paper is down, once it makes contact with the block, what I want to do is I want to sort of establish that paper so that it doesn't move as I'm actually applying pressure with the baron. So right now I'm just running my hand across it because that ink is kind of sticky. It basically will hold the paper in place. So now I'm ready to, um, to use my baron to apply pressure. And this actually takes a little bit of elbow grease and patience. So I'm moving the, the baron or the, the spoon in this case across the block in a circular motion. And what I'm looking for is eventually, I wanna be able to see kind of an embossment of that raised area. So in other words, as soon as I start seeing the edges of those shapes that I've carved, I know that I'm putting enough pressure to transfer that ink onto the paper. I would use, for hand printing like this, a thinner paper. So in other words, I have a, I have a Japanese paper with me that I can print. Um, and I would use a thinner paper because I'm the one applying pressure. And if it's a thick paper, it takes a lot more pressure than I can probably give to transfer that ink. So in other words, I do use, I do print with thicker paper but it's when I use a cylinder press. So for hand printing, I always want to use a thin paper. So for the final version of this, if I was hand printing it, or if I do the final version in hand printing, I'll use like a thinner Japanese paper. Um, and I have a piece here that I can kind of show you as well. So really the paper that I'll use for the final version is going to be almost as thin as the newsprint. And as you can see, it really requires a lot of patience to do it by hand and a lot of pressure. That's kind of a workout. So now you can see that that image is starting, the embossment is starting to kind of show through. So therefore, I'm feeling a little bit more confident about how this is transferring. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to peek at it and see if it's doing a pretty good transfer. It is, but I've missed a few spots. So I'm going to go in and Get the edges. All right, so we probably are ready to pull this. Yeah. So there's my print. Um, now for this one, I probably could have used a little bit more ink on the block. We can compare it with the other proof I ran right here, where this definitely is the right amount of ink. So this one is a, is a little under inked, but this is really what it should look like right here. So what I would do in that case is I would just, um, if I was going to print another one right now, I would just run more ink over top of that. So I don't clean the block off or anything like that. I just keep rolling ink on and then printing as I go. And the block will start to fill with more and more ink so that as I go, the prints will get oftentimes better and better. So I just wanted to uh, thank the Shenandoah National Park Trust. I think that this this program is is really amazing and i'll start from the standpoint of of an artist just just being an artist you know i'm often piecing together um a lot of things to make ends meet so a lot of us artists we we don't have like a lot of um 
we don't have a lot of safety nets and we don't have like a ton of money or or support and th what this this program um is such a such a gift in a way because i think that to be able to just to be put up in a, in a cabin for three weeks and told that you can m make you can focus on nothing but your artwork and your practice um i mean right there is is such a is so valuable uh, as as an artist so for the shenandoah national trust to support something like this you're really in a lot of ways um supporting those of us who have chosen to um to pursue uh, a career that is uh, where there's a lot of uncertainty and and not necessarily a lot of financial support so i mean this is really um this has been an amazing opportunity to to be here and to be in this landscape and to also to to just interact with people here you know um safely of course from a distance but it's it's been really great to interact with the people on the on the trails and you know the the park uh staff and i think that just that this whole experience will resonate with me you know um down the road.